Steve Prescott is an illustrator with a long history with games. He's worked on Vampire the Masquerade, Werewolf the Apocalypse, Shadowrun, Dungeons and Dragons, and he's done work on Magic the Gathering. We've got him next on Into the Ultra. Hey, welcome back to the show. This is Brian Stillman. Uh, this is Into the Ultra. We're talking to science fiction and fantasy artists. Um, and today, we're here with a friend of mine, Steve Prescott. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks for being Hello. here. Thank you for uh, having me. You, you've done a lot of stuff. You've done Dungeons and Dragons. You've done Magic the Gathering. Uh, you worked at White Wolf, right? You were doing stuff oh, yeah. for Vampire. So a lot of history there. I'm sure I missed a lot of stuff, too. So um, let's talk about some of that stuff, because that's what sure. we do here. Uh, we're yeah. talking about art um, and artists, and then whatever other randomness pops up. Yeah. Um, let's start with D and D because that's obviously close to my heart. Um, for you, you, how far back do you go with Dungeons and Dragons? Um, were you a player? I played a little bit in college. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I dabbled in it a little bit in high school. It was one friend of mine was into uh, it, and I had never heard of it before. Yeah. And so we played like just one afternoon, like we rolled up a character and played for like an hour. So I really didn't get, you know, neck deep into it then. Uh, it wasn't until college and, and I played maybe like three or four campaigns and it was, it was fun, but I have trouble taking almost anything seriously enough for it to, <laughs> for it to like <laughs> hold. So like me and my friends, all we do is goof off anyway. So the whole time we're just goofing off and like, and not even to the point of like storytelling, just to make each other laugh. So right, right. we had fun with it, but I don't think I really like got into D and D as far as you go in order to for, you know to become a huge D and D fan. Not that I was like poo pooing it, like I don't like D and D. Oh sure, sure. Two goofballs about it for the most part. I think a lot of the best games um, get a little weird at the table, though. Anyway, because um, yeah. you, when you put a bunch of friends together just hanging out, possibly with beer. Um, you know that's what's going to happen um how'd you get involved then as an artist uh with dungeons and dragons and in gaming in general so at the end of my uh i think it was my last semester in college the art director from uh white wolf came to talk to the illustration majors and he was looking at portfolios afterward and i didn't know like besides D and star wars i didn't know how vast and this is the mid nineties, mind you, it's, it's much more vast now. I didn't know how much gaming world was out there. I heard that there was this, you know, contemporary horror game guy that was coming to the school. And I was like, well, there's a lot of teeth and sexy vampires and stuff. That's somewhat interesting, but it wasn't my thing. Like I'm not neither into gaming necessarily or into horror. Like those were outside of my realms of interest. So but of course, White Wolf and Vampire the Masquerade yeah makes yeah. perfect sense if you're not in any yeah, of that I stuff monsters and they did pen and ink artwork and like right. or in, in the mid 90s they're like grooming you to be like a professional artist like you're gonna go do editorial illustration or children's right. book illustration so like drawing monsters sounded more interesting to me than than that uh so so yeah so you looked at my portfolio i had some pen and ink stuff and luckily i, I had a lot of pen and ink stuff like that was that was my medium of choice, I think, back then. Because I was into comic books a little bit more. Um, yeah, he liked my stuff, and I started working with White Wolf. Like, I don't know. In, in my hazy memory from 25 years ago, it was, like, it was like weeks later I was starting to do stuff for White Wolf. And they just made me a workhorse for a good, like, six or seven years. I just did tons of stuff for White Wolf. So, so tell me a little bit about that. I mean, White Wolf... Uh, Vampire was sort of a game changer in the 90s for for role-playing games um, but also a lot of the art coming out of it it was that like dark um, very uh, atmospheric black and white art is what I most remember uh, your stuff Tim Bradstreet um, what what was the kind of environment like um, you know how are you working with them what was that process like it's similar to how I work now. Like they gave me, they, you know, contacted me saying, Hey, we have this book on whatever coyote right. shapeshifters coming up. Would you want to do uh, work for that? And I'm like, yeah, of course. 
And so they just send me a list of all the illustrations that they need. Most of the time it was just a bunch of half page, like black and white half page. And some of it was much more open. Like we just need some cool looking stuff to fill the page. Other things were more specific, like we need a shaman here and we need mm -hmm. someone using this in, enchantment spell here. I don't know, stuff like that. But as opposed to now where I get commissioned and it's like two or three pieces with magic or hearthstone, I was getting like a list of like 15 or 20 pieces. That <laughs> That's awesome. I'd, I'd spend like a, an evening just reading over and trying to get visuals for each piece and then I'd start to work on that. So, and, and, and also this is like early on in, in internet world. So I was still at that. And when I started with a white wolf, I was faxing in sketches, right, right. In sketches. <laughs> <laughs> and I was sending my originals too, cause I didn't have a scanner. So I had a bunch of black and white and I'd tape it up in a big box and overnight it to white wolf. And I did that for years. They just you know, hoping it shows up in one piece and everything. I never, I never had a problem with it. They always sent the artwork back and never had a problem until like two or three years ago with, you know, with magic, I had a problem with a piece of artwork getting damaged on the way home. But other than that, like all those hundreds and hundreds of packages I sent to, to not only white wolf, but to Fossa who was doing shadow run in the later yep. I was working with them. No problems with that. Just analog shipping artwork to them. <laughs> Old school, man. So um, what, what, you know, like you said, it was pre-internet, but it was also pre, you know, Twilight. You know what I mean? Like there's like, we didn't have a ton of movies. Like what was your inspiration for things like vampires and werewolves and and all the stuff that they were doing in in vampire uh, and all the spin-off games what were you what were your go-to's and how did you keep those kind of classic monsters fresh uh that's a good question i i wasn't too like super moody with my artwork i mean if you saw it back then i brought kind of with the same flair i bring now to artwork like there's a little bit more for lack of a better term like whimsy and kind of a goofy stylization like there was a funness even if it was a vampire like screaming and blowing up the heads of vampires behind him or humans there was like <laughs> there was a comic book element to it not to the point of being like goofball but uh it just the stylization it wasn't like brad street like brad street was very moody like there are a lot of artists that like were gritty and more horror based and i brought like a comic book look to it i think mm -hmm. So with that in mind, like my biggest go-to was Mike Mignola. Like I think it was the Wolves of St. August or something like that. I was like, that's the kind of werewolves I want to draw. You know, top heavy from the waist up with like little wolf legs down below. And I got a lot of mood and inspiration, not only from what he was drawing, but from how he used blacks, like really dark shadow areas that were like almost compositional elements. I didn't straight up ape his style. A couple times I veered into it pretty hard, but like, uh, I just, I used that for influence and I just I kept trying to push like the darks as far as I could and make it moodier and more atmospheric. How receptive were they at White Wolf to your pushing styles in different directions? Because um, like you say, it's very different than Bradstreet, who I think in yeah. many ways for many people defined that early look for, yeah. for White Wolf. Very noir, very Lost Boys, you know, a lot of leather jackets with like yeah. bits and, you know, like dirt and stuff all around. Um, yep. How receptive were they to to you bringing different styles into it? They let me do whatever I wanted to see, and and I don't. I, I was pretty good friends with uh, all the art directors there that I worked with, so I never got any flack or heard that they were like mad that I <laughs> chose to do some series of artwork in some other way. But I was doing right. so much for them, mm -hmm. so black and white, and I. I have a tendency to just get burned out if it's repetitive, not just subject matter, but if, if I'm doing like, I don't know, 40 half page black and white pieces over the course of two months, like I got to do something to shake it up, right. even if it's slightly different subject matter. So I dabbled in different mediums all the time. Like I did stuff in pencil for them. I did brush and ink. I did black and white acrylic for one really old piece. And okay. Yeah. I did charcoal, even charcoal with pen and ink. So they, I, you know, I can't remember if I told them I was going to do that <laughs> before I started it or if I just handed them the artwork, like, here you go. Right. Hope that it was all right. But 
they never had a complaint. And it, it, if anything, like it, it, it helped me like survive doing that without, a, you know, without getting burned out, without it just feeling like I was going through the motions. Vampires or werewolves, which are more fun to draw? Werewolves, definitely. I'm more of a yeah. creature guy. And, and at the time, I mean, that might be different now because I, I find a lot of interest in costume design and stuff. But uh, okay. yeah, I like the, the nature, rugged, barbarian aspect of the of the most of the werewolf tribe. So it was fun to decorate them and whatever teeth and horns and rough leather outfits and just draw monsters and a lot of teeth. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> generally speaking, what do you think are cooler werewolves or vampires? I mean, not to, if you didn't, not drawing okay. them, but yeah. generally. <laughs> that's, that's a good question. Am I going to admit and make one section of the fandom mad and the other not? Well, possibly, but what you really have to worry about is how many of the ones that you piss off are either vampires or werewolves, <laughs> and are they going to come after you? Because, I mean, <laughs> you just never know. No silver in the house right now. Oh, well. <laughs> I don't know. I, if I had to answer, I'd say, like, I have more, uh, more interest in drawing... Uh, vampires now so we'll go with vampires this time all right as long as they're like cool and super gothic vampires and not right not whatever. sparkly yeah not sparkly love struck <laughs> one you mentioned shadow run um and you right. did a lot of work with fasa that's not something you hear popping up too often these days i mean i know shadow run they've released a new edition not too too long ago um yeah. that was kind of a batshit crazy game like world that they created i loved it because it was so bonkers but you yeah. had, like, um, for anyone watching who's never played Shadowrun before, you had, like, cyberpunk hackers combined with magic-using shamans and orcs. And, like, you could be a combination of all three. It was completely bonkers and completely off the rails. Um, what, what sort of stuff were you doing for them? everything for them it was it was awesome i loved working on on shadowrun when it was you know in fasa and i think fan pro took over in the late 90s maybe into the 2000s uh it almost seemed like anything i could draw worked like there was very rarely any instances when they're like nah not that like it was just so much fun and there was no they didn't have like a style guide so to speak where they're like these are the kind of guns that they carry right, on. right. Have cyberware they have and this is the specific kind of cybernetic arms that orcs have or whatever it was like wide open like to interpretation so i just drew whatever i want or whatever i wanted with them you know it was just it was fun to do that stuff that seems like a really cool gig given how expansive the the worlds were in shadow run having yeah. that kind of freedom i imagine is sort of what you look for as an illustrator and and as an artist yeah yeah it would be done way different now, I think. Mm. Uh, I don't. I doubt that Wizards of the Coast and Magic set this precedent, but they, you know, they want a specific look for each of their sets, right? So they're uh, they have a style guide, so everything looks consistent. I think if Shadowrun was to come back, they wouldn't let the artists do whatever they want. They'd probably want the, a little bit of guidelines, like to establish, like this is what cybernetics. This is what right. the 2020 version of 2009 is supposed to look like or, or whatever right. it's it's funny that you, you sort of talk about all that because now that i'm thinking back i realized there wasn't like how open-ended all the tech always looked and that's what kept it yeah. kind of feeling like a real world like you know you watch star trek and there's a defined look to it and i love the yeah. defined look to star trek um yep. but the real world you know company a puts out their their smartphone and company b puts out their smartphone and at least until everyone tried to look like Apple, everything kind of looked different and everything yeah. kind of tried to stand out. So you end up with this hodgepodge of technology and hodgepodge of design aesthetics. Um, and that's what makes things feel kind of organic. And yeah. Shadowrun really captured that. Um, that's true. If you think about it in a, in like a worldwide, you know, uh, cyberpunk mm -hmm. DNA, that, you know, this city might have shabbier looking right right aesthetics and guns and weapons and vehicles but this one might be super slick so it, it i think it fit in in that sense where you just think of it like these are different factions and of course there's going to be different levels of decay and technology so it worked for me at least um and all this is funny because i started off asking you let's let's ask about let's talk about dungeons and dragons 
And we got a foray into White Wolf and uh, Shadowrun, but I think that's important because that's the stuff leading up to, um, yeah. besides being super interesting, because it's rare to bump into people who worked on those games, um, stuff that were formulative parts of my growing up in the 80s and 90s. But um, yeah. Dungeons and Dragons um, is how I think I first got exposed to your work. Um, when did you start working on that? And, and what sort of stuff were you doing? That was uh, early 2000s. Like I want to say 2002. Um, fantasy was still outside of, not super far, but it was still like, it was just outside of my interest zone. Like I was still, I was doing the White Wolf contemporary look. For the most part, they had stuff that, you know, dabbled in the past. Mm -hmm. There wasn't like magic and orcs and stuff like that, wearing, you know, armor and carrying swords and staffs. And of course, there was the Shadowrun stuff, which was much more what I was into, you know, in college and in high school. I was into, you know, space marines and military hardware of the future and all that. So that was, you know, scratching that itch. So I wasn't really interested in in D and D that much and drawing dragons and things like that. Not that I, again, I didn't hate it. It just wasn't my, right. Right. Sure. But my buddy, uh, Matt Cavada, who I went to school with, he was a couple years ahead of me or maybe one year ahead of me. He was working on D and D and he, uh, he couldn't finish a project for some reason. I want to say he was maybe having his first kid or something like that. Uh, and he's like, Hey, can you finish it? It was just like four pieces for forgotten realms. And we had been in touch and he's like, do you want to finish these pieces for me? I just cannot finish these. He's like, I ran it by my art director. Like they're cool with it. And mind you, like this is early two thousands. Like I was still super raw with color. Like I was doing black and white for shadow run black and white for white wolf and whatever other little projects in there. Very little color stuff. I did a few like vampire uh, cards. I did a few like white wolf covers, I think. Um, that were that were painted for the most part I was pretty stunted with color work and with with figuring out how I wanted to use acrylic um, so he handed these off to me and I kind of redrew them in my style and painted them terribly <laughs> or at least in my eyes <laughs> they were serviceable but looking back I'm like holy crap are these bad but for whatever reason that got my foot in the door and they they gave me work after that. So mm -hmm. I forget what book that was. Again, these, these are some bad pieces of artwork that I did. And thank goodness they saw something in that artwork where they're like, yeah, we'll give Steve a few more assignments here. And was I was that, able to grow into it quickly. How did you kind of grow into it? You know, you said fantasy wasn't quite your thing. Um, how do you attack something like that, projects like that, um, and get into the headspace of, of these types of creatures, these types of worlds and scenarios. Yeah. Um, how do you make that work? I guess I, I, I get motivated and by the, uh, by the challenge of it. So in this case, like, Oh, fantasy stuff, you know, I, I wouldn't go seek it out necessarily. And this again is 20 years ago or so I wouldn't go seeking it out. But if someone says, can you do this? I'd be like, yeah, Sure, I've, I've never done that, but I want to try that out. I'm always open to trying whatever weird assignments come my way that like seem like it's outside the normal, you know, conveyor belt of artwork <laughs> I have to churn out. Uh, so I think probably early on it was that. And I was, I mean, I did have a little bit of fantasy in my past because I loved Conan and uh, Beastmaster and Willow. Right. So there, was a, there was like just cinematic sense of like, oh, that stuff was cool. Mm. and then once I started doing that I started to look at the artwork uh of other artists that worked on D&D &D. so at the time like Lockwood was the was the main artist working on D&D right. &D. or at least like he was doing all the flagship artwork yes yeah. so I was looking at his stuff I looked at Matt's stuff because he had great he was mainly working on magic I want to say at the time but he did do some D&D &D as well and that kind of opened the door to like a bunch of artists that I didn't follow before, but like since mm. I was going to be doing this, like I'm suddenly interested in all this stuff. I, I'm looking at Tony Dieterlizzi's stuff now, and I think Zug had a few, or Zug did some Shadowrun stuff, so I knew of his right. work. Then I saw some magic stuff. So like it kind of like started to put different artists and different sensibilities for how they interpret the fantasy world right. under my 
And I think I just started being like, hey, wait, I, I am kind of into this. Like, I am enjoying this. I'm enjoying all these other people's artworks, how they, like, their their uh, sensibility for, like, how they design the armor and, you know, magic use and stuff like that. So it kind of, yeah, it kind of unlocked, like, that level for me, I think, back then. Literally leveling up into... I literally uh, leveled up. <laughs> <laughs> that was terrible. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Cut that out. Right. That, gone. Um, so, and fast forward a little bit, in fifth edition, you went from just taking illustration orders and things like that to actually working on the, the style guide, the design Bible for Dungeons and Dragons, for the new release of Dungeons and Dragons, fifth edition. Um, yep. What were you doing for that? And what were some of the things that you were working on um, that you were designing, you were creating for, for the game? For fifth edition, all I did was the goblinoids and the and uh, the owl bear. I think at the time I had a bunch of stuff going on and I couldn't take on a bunch. And uh, I forget who the art director was. It might have been Shindahedi for that too. He wanted me just to work on you know we need a hobgoblin, goblin, bugbear, and later on he wanted me to make a new owl bear. So that's all like, and I did one like full page piece of goblins, like a raiding party of goblins. And I think that's all I did for fifth edition. Well, but the crazy thing is that's pretty significant. I mean, the goblin, the hobgoblin, the bugbear and the owlbear are these classic creatures that go back to the earliest days of Dungeons and Dragons. They're yeah. go-to bad guys. They're sort of staple foundational bad guys. When you need, when you need an army of baddies, goblins yeah. with their hobgoblin bosses, and uh, what the hell, maybe a few of them have owl bears on leashes. Might as well. Um, how did you approach um, the redesign and um, the, the style for, for some of those? Um, can you talk a little bit about uniting the goblinoid races um, yeah. and, and your approach to that? Yeah, that, I worked with the art director fairly closely on that, I remember, because they definitely wanted the goblinoids to look like they were all not the same race, but they're all descended from the same, you know, DNA branch of the tree. So there had to be like some defining feature that like carried over from one to the next. And that was mainly like their nose and their cheek structure, kind of like a broader face, you know, above the jawline. And they have a weird kind of animal, like a cross between a hog and a dog nose. I thought if I can just get these a few basic shapes, to carry over from one race to the next. And then I can just, you know, do their hair and their their morphology, their body structure is all different and that would work out. So it was a lot of that, a lot of tinkering. I think I had like five or six sketchbook pages of just heads trying to get that down and make it look like it's consistent from one to the next. It was fun to do. I like doing that kind of stuff. Is there a, a different process to approaching um, the kind of canonical design of a creature versus saying, okay, I've got to come up with the design of a creature for this single illustration. Like they're asking me to come up with this one, this thing that's going to appear once or, or, you know, whatever versus yeah. the thing that's going to establish the foundational look for everything else that's coming after it, at least until yeah. the next redesign. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't approach it too much differently unless like I have to make it look like the old designs like carry over, you know, they, they, they didn't want the goblins to be completely redesigned to where they weren't recognizable from earlier. I mean, there's right. kind of, elves have to have pointy ears. Otherwise, are they really elves? Vampires have to have pointy teeth. Otherwise, you know, there's, there's carryover features that just have to come along with it. So in that sense, like, I might have thrown out some crazier like envelope pushing sketches and and, uh, and the art director might have been like, let's bring that in. That's a little bit too crazy. We want it to be, we want it to look like it could be a D&D, &D, you know, goblin. So there's a little bit more work involved in finding like where the, what the parameters are. But if, yeah, when there's a, an illustration with just a single race that might not ever appear again, like I still, put as much like heart and soul into that as I can and as long as it looks cool like what my job is what all these artists you know fantasy artist job is making look cool is the number one thing it has right. to look cool 
and then you follow some other rules after that. So, so that's, that's the approach I take for both of those. Can you talk a little bit about approaching monsters, approaching creature design, um, and, and making them feel right on the page and also feeling fantastical and, and all those yeah. other elements? Uh, that is difficult. Like a lot of it is feeling it out as you're, as, as I'm drawing, mm -hmm. like it's adjusting like the proportions, like, Obviously, you can't put a normal proportioned owl head on a normal proportioned bear body. That's ridiculous. So you have to like find like what feels right, what looks cool as a silhouette, like and how much you're going to incorporate. If you're like say you're blending two or three animals or whatever to make some super creature, a lot of it is like I don't literally think of numbers in my head like percentage numbers, but that's kind of what how I'm thinking. Like this owl bear is going to be whatever 75 percent bear but i gotta make 25 percent owl like look mm -hmm. right. like that feels like a good ratio it, i don't you know half and half would be weird because then you're talking about like what are the key features of an owl its head first of all then its wings then maybe it's weird fuzzy four-fingered feet or whatever so like can you use the feet can you use the wings probably not the wings it's not supposed to be a flying creature so you have to like you have to like break down key features of what these animals are and and mix the features that you think are key and then adjust like how much of one and how much of the other mm -hmm. until you get like the right feel the right the right ratio and then the right silhouette for the piece so it's i'm making it sound like it's a really really complicated process it's not necessarily complicated but sometimes it can take a long time to get something as different as an owl and a bear like <laughs> look right when you mix them because really that's one of those animals that it's almost like from greek mythology right where they're like this creature is you know it has one human leg and 15 heads and has the body of a rat you know it just like that sounds stupid but you have to find a way to make it look cool and and like mixing a bear with an owl doesn't necessarily sound more ferocious than a, a bear <laughs> <You're adding an laughs> owl. but you have to find a way to make it look cool so it's all a matter of adjusting and like what can i get away with to make a, a an owl's face look vicious and you know you know mean and capable of ripping people apart so so you also work on magic the gathering which obviously tons of fantasy um it feels like you've really kind of embraced the fantasy side of of your art um, how'd you get involved for magic? How did you move from D and D to magic? Um, and, and what's the process like working on that game? So it was like 2006 or whatever, when, uh, Jeremy Cranford was the art director at the time. And I had met Jeremy, I think when I was out there, I, I flew out to Seattle to do Eberron concept design work like a couple years earlier. And I was, and after that, I was consistently doing like Eberron interiors and Eberron covers, and I did some D and D stuff outside of that. Uh, and Jeremy, he liked my stuff. He just liked whatever, whatever like flair and sensibility uh, I had in my work. He liked enough to he came to me to do magic work. I was way intimidated by it. Like my some of my favorite artists ever, like Lockwood and Mark Zug and Chris Moeller, like they were working on magic, and I'm like, those guys are untouchable. Like, I'm going to just keep doing my stuff over here. Like, maybe one day I'll do magic, but I, I better stick to what I know here. Um, but but Jeremy's like, would you like to try one of these? I think he had, uh, it was Future Sight, I think might have been the set. Or Time Spiral, one of those two. And I think he had some pieces that were kind of short turnaround, and he wanted to know if I would be interested in doing them. Like, basic. Nothing off of any, like, style guy stuff. Like, we need an angel a male angel and we need a tree folk guy right or a body double and of course i was like i yeah i'll do that you know i'm nervous like behind the scenes i'm like holy crap now i'm in the big time <laughs> like, <laughs> now i really gotta ratchet it up here um and then they had me come out for uh lorwin's concept design while i was working on those so i was working on lorwin concept design at the wizards of the coast building and going back to my hotel room and working on finishing those paintings in the evening so that was like my my like you know zero to 100 miles an hour uh dive into magic and after that i've been doing magic pretty consistently um how uh, do you approach that 
Um, what are they asking of you uh, as a concept designer for a game like Magic? So they have parameters that you have to like fit your world into. Like they have an idea for a world. This is whatever gothic horror, colonial world, or you know this is uh, our, the magic take on Greek mythology world. And so there's like a, they give you basically a, a sandbox, and like you're playing this sandbox. So it's a lot of just idea generating and you trying to sell ideas with nice drawings, and it's awesome. Like to. I mean, I love doing full illustrations, like, you know, fully rendering like the environment and putting the character into this environment, and telling a story that way. But this is like boiling it down to just design, like just design these monsters to look awesome or these warriors or these magic users to look awesome and like sell all the little elements and like really you're building the world and like you're injecting the storytelling into like cultures and stuff. And it's like, I love doing that stuff. I'm doing it right now for them and it's, it's just a blast. Um, is, is it more open-ended for you as an artist? Like, are, is there more room to kind of explore stuff? Like how much of the stuff that you kind of bring together and, and are designing is fun to explore, but ultimately maybe gets pushed aside as they focus on yeah. other elements or other aspects or other stuff you've done? I mean, you're, you're building a setting. So at least at first, anything that you can fit in this setting and start fleshing it out to make it feel like, oh, there's a culture here and there. You can picture like families and, you know, vendors selling whatever, rabbits on a stick at the corner or whatever. Like if, if you can fill it with enough detail that you can picture how that would look, like the, high, the rabbit on a stick vendor at the corner, whatever, like to that extent beyond just like, here's the warrior and here's the mage and the priest or whatever um that's what you're aiming for to make it feel like it's all uh there's a texture to the entire plane but of course they need for the gameplay there's definitely like spots you have to hit like we need to know what this creature looks like and what the you know the larger version of this creature looks like we need to know what a warrior in this culture looks like we need to know a sorcerer or a magic user a priest a cleric all those things they you need to hit by you know the end of the three week stint you have to like check that off the list of what those things look like as examples so usually by some point in you're focused on filling in those gaps and not so much in like what does the shoe look like right. on, uh, on the typical guy that's just going down to the bazaar <laughs> do you have a a favorite card that you worked on over the years a piece that you're really stands out for you or a couple favorite that you've worked on so that goblin contraption from what was it unstable yeah so that's big that, that's a nine piece and that was the biggest illustration i've ever done for magic uh that was fun it was super intensive but it was one of those ones that was like well off of what how i normally am approaching a magic piece like make this monster look cool on a you know, a 12 by 16 image or whatever. This was like, I had a, a totally different approach and there wasn't even like, there was composition, but it was so like chaotic that I was right. basically orchestrating chaos. So that was really fun to do. Uh, it's stuff like that, like that's like not normal is the, the things that I like the best. Like uh, Yule Ooze is another one of my favorites, which is just a gross aspic, one of those jello mold foods that they eat in uh, England, I think, or whatever. In but it's a, it's a monster. It's basically a gelatinous ooze, like on a medieval feast table. Like there's nothing else. There's no people at the table. It's just a, a spread of all these delicious foods. And then this gross thing in the middle that like looks like it's going to kill and eat everything on it. So like weird stuff like that is usually goes up my list of like things that I look fondly on. Um, it's interesting that, you know, you're all in on fantasy now when early on, you know, fantasy was something outside your, your, your scope of interest yeah. or it's tightly. And yet here you found yourself deep in it. Um, yeah. What attracts you to fantasy art today? You know, where are you in, in terms of that headspace today? It's because anything goes, right? I mean, obviously the art directors, whatever you're working on, there are limits, but it's so wide open to interpretation and, and like stylization and you can put a lot more like to me at least i can put a lot more of my own voice you know my own uh style into stuff 
then if I was working on something like contemporary or whatever, we'd, I'd say with sci-fi, you could probably do that too. But like fantasy, I just feel like this is cool. It's kind of like a, uh, I don't know. It's, it's just a, a big playground where I can, I can pull like shape elements from, I don't know, Native American costume design, but also mix it with a little bit of, I don't know, Japanese, like traditional Japanese hairstyles or something like that. And you kind of mush them so it doesn't look like, why is, you know, Native American and Japanese from two different centuries, like that doesn't look right. But you can, you know, and kind of play around, kind of like mixing the owl and the bear, like you mush it around and make it look right. Cause you're just using, you're basically using cool shapes and just pushing it together. And like the openness for creativity and that has really appealed to me. That's why I haven't gotten sick of it in, you know, 20 some odd years now. Cool. So, Steve, where can people go and check out your work these days? On my uh, neglected websites. <laughs> Actually, probably the best place would be on Instagram. So it's at the Steve Prescott Instagram. Although I, I haven't posted anything. I've been busy. Weirdly, I've been busy during this whole quarantine thing. All right. So they can find you on Instagram, um, your neglected website. What's the URL of the neglected website? So that's rotface.com, R-O-T-T-F-A-C-E.com. And then I have a store that's defunct because I don't know anything about WordPress and no one's been able to help me. <laughs> so someday. <sighs> you can go to, you know, I'm Steve trying to help you. But I'm trying to help now. you here, Steve. I'm trying to get the word out and um, you're not making this easy. I'm busy with other stuff. So I'm just, well, that's good. Like, yeah. Yeah, I'd rather be busy making artwork than busy like packaging up prints and taking them to the post office. Like that's tedious work to me. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and of course, when once the world returns to normal, we see you at conventions all the time at Gen Con yeah. and all the others. So um, yeah. hopefully, we'll all get back to that really soon. Exactly. Uh, all right, Steve Prescott here at Into the Ultra. Steve, thanks so much for being on the show. Uh, Thank you. It's great. Great getting to talk to you since God knows when we'll ever be let out of our houses again. Yeah, yeah. Soon enough, I'm sure, right? I hope. I'm sure. I, yeah, I hope. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Hi, everyone. Thanks for watching Into the Ultra. I hope you enjoyed the interview. If you want to see more, please subscribe. We drop new episodes every Tuesday. You can also check out some of my other projects. I'm a documentary filmmaker. I made a movie called Plastic Galaxy, the story of Star Wars toys, and I co-produced and co-directed a documentary called Eye of the Beholder, the art of Dungeons and Dragons. Both are available on Amazon Prime and iTunes and a host of other streaming services. And if you want to follow along with my newest project, I co-produced it with Cave Girl Productions. It's called Igniting the Spark, the story of Magic the Gathering, and I posted a link to that down in the description. Thank you very much. I hope to see you next Tuesday.